All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. We have a jam-packed show for you today. We're going to be covering our bragging rights champ of the year, the individual NBA player that had the best season, the guy that should feel as though he's on the mountaintop based on what he accomplished last year. After that, we got a bunch of good mailbag questions from you guys. We're going to be bouncing all around the league, talking about a bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, tweaking the end of the week schedule, I, I don't know if I was hallucinating or what the deal was, but I had mentioned that we might be covering the GM survey on Friday, and that doesn't come out till October. So clearly, I don't know what I had seen. I could have sworn I like was scrolling and I'd seen something talking about it. And clearly, I didn't actually see that. So obviously, I can't cover the GM survey on Friday because there is no GM survey, not for another month. So what we're going to do at the tail end of this week before we head into our series, our season previews next year or next week, I should say, to, uh, to uh, tonight, Wednesday night, we're going to be covering the WNBA matchup between the Las Vegas Aces and the Indiana Fever. So Asia Wilson versus Caitlin Clark. Going to be a lot of fun, big time game. We're going to be breaking it down on YouTube right after the game. Later this week, I wanted to take some time to do a video breakdown on the specific things that has made Caitlin Clark such a devastating offensive player. She now leads the WNBA in total assists by a pretty wide margin. She uh, is leading the best offense in the WNBA over the last 10 games. A lot of really, really exciting stuff coming out of Indiana, so I want to spend some time talking about the basketball of what has made Caitlin so good. So that's going to be what we're doing at the tail end of this week. And then starting next week on Monday, that's where we're going to kick it into high gear with our season previews, power ranking style, kind of working our way uh, uh, through the NBA hierarchy while also taking some time to get into the weeds and see how those teams are going to play this season. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your podcast under Hoops Tonight. Don't forget, it is helpful for us if you leave a rating and a review on that front. And last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in those YouTube comments so we can keep hitting them throughout the rest of the fall. And then really quickly, before we get started, I want to talk to you guys about game time. You know how live events are. There's nothing quite like being in the arena. It's crazy. I'm a huge Dead & Company fan. I've loved that music for a long time. I, John Mayer, I think, is the best guitarist of this particular era, maybe of all time. And um, I've always enjoyed their music, but then like going to see them at the Sphere was quite possibly the coolest single night experience of my life. It was such a great time. There's nothing quite like it. Then there's like the Arizona Diamondbacks. It looks like they're going to get in the playoffs again this year. Uh, they're in a little bit of a, a, a race. They're two games up of uh, of the being out of the wild card. They're in a little bit of a race with the Atlanta Braves and the New York Mets, if I remember correctly. But I really enjoyed that playoff run last year, and so I might try to hop up to Phoenix to see a playoff game. But there's just nothing quite like being actually in the arena. And this is where game time comes to the surface. They're my personal favorite ticketing app. I've had amazing experiences with them this year. They were the ones who hooked me up when I went to go uh, see the Sphere. got an amazing deal on a last-minute thing when I had some family in Vegas, and I just was like, on the day of, I was like, I want to go, and I was able to find a great deal with their flash deals, which is one of their awesome features that they have. It's just a great all-around ticket-buying experience. You can check out in as few as two taps, so it's not convoluted. It's all in pricing, so you don't get confused. You know exactly what you're paying before you go to check out. And you get a view of your seat within the app, so you know exactly what you're paying for with your money. Also, <clears throat> Game Time is introducing Game Time Picks, where they actually curate your options. Make sure you're looking at specifically good deals, uh, uh, the best deals that are available for that particular show, so that it makes it easier for you to save money on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code HOOPS. For $20 off your first purchase, terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code HOOPS, that's H-O-O-P-S for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. All right, let's talk some basketball. So, obviously, I take the player ranking side of things very seriously. It's interesting because I don't think it matters quite as much as it used to. Basketball is a sport that... Uh, compared to other professional sports, team sports is very dependent on your best player. There's more impact on the win and loss from that best player than you see in other sports. But I actually think that's starting to uh, not cease to be the case, but it's being the case less so than it used to. And the main reason why I think that is, is just defenses are so much better than they used to be. They're so athletic. They cover so much ground that it's easier than ever to get the ball out of your star's hands. And then it becomes so much more important for you have guys off the ball that can capitalize on that attention and specifically dribble, shoot, and pass, which is something that off-ball players uh, in NBA history have been you know, less talented with. And I, I think it's been really interesting. I think uh, the Tatum with the Celtics is a great example of this. Like, If you go back 
through NBA history, it's like the 2023 championship, uh, Jokic, best player in the world. 2022, Steph, first or second best player in the world. Giannis in 2021, best player in the world, right? 2020, LeBron, best player in the world. 2019, Kawhi, you know, second, third, best player in the world. KD in 2018, second best player in the world, second or third. 17, KD, second or third. LeBron in 16, best player in the world. Steph in 15, you know, second best player in the world. Like, it's usually like one of the absolute top tier guys that leads his team to the title. And I think it was really fascinating to watch the Celtics not just win, but win convincingly while having a, a legitimate top 10 player, but not a guy that we think is on the same level as the guys at the very top of the league, right? And I think that's really fascinating, and it's because of that more team-oriented path to success in modern NBA basketball with spacing and driving and kicking and capitalizing on attention that is drawn by the primary action at the beginning of the possession, right? And so obviously it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. That said, having the best player still matters a great deal. Uh, I thought Luca, in particular, at least in the Western Conference, flexed those muscles to help push his team from series to series, and so we and he made it to the finals. Got about as close as you can get to winning, right? Three wins away from getting the actual area B. And so, even though the league is trending a little bit away from the idea of like the best player mattering that much, I still think it matters quite a bit. And so, player rankings are a fun way for us to kind of discuss that over the summer. And it's something that I've always cared about quite a bit, especially going back to when I was a kid. I used to argue about this stuff all the time with my teammates when I was in college, you know, just shooting the shit on the sidelines while we're taking our shoes off or while we're on the bus or on the way to dinner or something like that. You know how it goes. Like, it's always been something that I've been a fan of. And so I take it very seriously. And uh, my criteria this year was a little different. And as, as I was trying to find a criteria that made the most sense within the context of what the NBA actually demands from its superstars, right? And so what I settled on, was the idea of like a draft that would take place in a kind of like in a vacuum, everyone's starting from scratch, but you need players to lead you from October to June. That was the the best way that I thought I could quantify what we would actually need from a player for this coming NBA season. But as we know, there are other ways to look at it, right? There's the, what if we had a game tomorrow? Like who, who, who are you uh, picking to lead you in that sort of situation? I still have the same top two in that situation with Jokic and then um, with Luca, but like all of a sudden, I'm gonna have guys like LeBron shoot up that list. Guys like Steph are gonna shoot up that list. Guys like KD are gonna shoot up that list, right? Guys like Kawhi are gonna shoot up that list. You know, guys that aren't necessarily workhorses for the regular season the way they used to, but guys that are still, you know, alpha dog type of talents in a smaller sample size, right? But I actually last year used a different criteria than either of those. I used the bragging rights method, essentially, the idea that. <clears throat> This is a list to demonstrate what actually happened on the court, like how these players actually performed when all the stakes were, you know, what they were in that specific season. And uh, I got a lot of pushback, right? Like I had Luca way down at 10 because he missed the playoffs. You know, I had uh, the, the way that that list kind of worked out. Uh, I ended up having a whole other list of, of complaints, right? And so we went away from that method this year. That said, I still think it matters, right? Like, why do we play the games? We play the games because you're trying to win. You're trying to hoist the Larry O'Brien trophy, right? And the best player in the league doesn't always win, but he usually gets pretty close. And so what I wanted to do is just shout out the player that I thought had the bragging rights for this particular season. So basically what this means, this is the singular NBA player that I think had the best season this last year from start to finish, including the postseason, including the quality of competition, who you played against, all the different things that are wrapped up into that specific context. Now, last year, I thought it was the same guy who would have been the best in all the lists, which was Nikola Jokic, right? But Nikola Jokic got eliminated in the second round this year, struggled to knock down jump shots, had a pretty rough defensive series, not his best moment. I didn't think he had the best season from start to finish. The player that I picked as the bragging rights champ for this season was Luka Doncic. Here's a list of his accomplishments just from this season. He won the scoring title, averaging 33.9 points per game. He was the most efficient high-volume pull-up jump shooter last year in the NBA among players who attempted at least 500 pull-up jump shots. He made first-team All-NBA. He was third in MVP voting, made the All-Star team. He had a 73-point game. He had another 50-point game. He had 13 40-point games. He had eight games with at least 15 assists. And as we know, in the postseason, he ended up taking his team all the way to the NBA Finals. And I thought he had the biggest moment, like the coolest individual singular moment of any NBA player of the season, I thought was Luka Doncic's game winner 
over Rudy Gobert in Game 2 of the Western Conference Finals. Nasty series of dribble combinations that baited Rudy into over uh, over uh, playing a drive to the to Luca's right hand side, so that Luca was able to get some separation on a step back, going to his right, knock down the shot, and it was crazy because in the wild part was in the moment, every one of us who was watching that game knew that that was going in the minute Luca got the switch. It just kind of felt inevitable. It was kind of like the pathway of that series too, like. Minnesota was keeping the games close, but it just felt like Dallas was the better team, and Luca really stamped that with that game winner. Um, but there's here's like that still just barely scratches the surface. I, I just wanted to sh- shout out another. I've got another half dozen crazy stats for you guys to demonstrate just how good Luka Doncic was this year. The Mavs were 11.9 points per 100 possessions better with him on the floor versus off the floor. That number went up to 17.4 points per 100 possessions in the postseason. Luka scored 148 more points than any other player in the NBA playoffs. Second place on that list was actually Kyrie Irving, interestingly enough. Uh, Luka had 24 more rebounds than any other player in the NBA playoffs. Luka had 55 more assists than any other player in the NBA playoffs. So he had by far more points, rebounds, and assists than any player in the NBA playoffs. He had 17 more steals than any player in the NBA playoffs. Some really good off-ball work from him last year in the postseason. He scored in pick and roll 34 more times than any other player in the NBA playoffs. He scored in ISO four more times than any other player in the NBA playoffs. Once again, Kyrie Irving was second place in that list. Just an unbelievable year from an unbelievable player in Luka Doncic. It was really cool to watch him lift a defensive-minded roster with some limited offensive players, aside from Kyrie Irving, obviously, to uh, all the way through that brutal Western Conference. Just ran into a really bad matchup against the Boston Celtics in the finals. And Boston, by the way, like I I thought they were better than everyone in the league except for Denver. And so it just was a really tough matchup. I actually uh, predicted that Boston would blow them out multiple times in that series and it ended up being what happened. It's just kind of a tough matchup. It's it's kind of interesting how that works. Like like Minnesota, all these centers, they give Jokic all these issues, right? Then they run into Dallas and it's like Minnesota's perimeter defenders are too thin. So Luka just bullies them. And they easily dispatch of Minnesota. Then you go to the finals and it's like Boston is a roster that's thin on the front line, but really strong in perimeter defense. And so it's like all of a sudden, all these big bodied perimeter defenders that can deal with kind of Luka's bully ball attack and ended up being a tough matchup for Luka. And that would have been a better matchup for Jokic, right? And that's kind of the interesting part of the way basketball works. Like we always think about who's the best team and who's going to win, but more often than not, it comes down to matchups. It kind of goes back to my rant at the beginning of the show. Like I just, as I've learned more about the game and learned more about the way NBA offenses and defenses work. I've just become more and more aware of the fact that like, it's not as straightforward as just adding up your parts and seeing whether or not that can carry you all the way to mid June. It's, it's really about like matchup versatility. How vulnerable are you to certain types of teams? Because if you got to beat four of them, inevitably you're going to run into a team that can attack your specific weakness and you've got to have a the ability to overcome it. And so it was a really fascinating type of postseason. But in spite of that, I thought that Luka was by far the best individual performer of last season. And I think he deserves the bragging rights title for this particular uh, NBA offseason. TD Tutty taking it to the house. In for six. Whatever you call a touchdown, one thing is for sure. Touchdowns matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. On the ground, in the air, from the special teams or defense, we don't care how they score them. We want to bet on touchdowns. And DraftKings Sportsbook is the number one place to bet touchdowns. Ready to place your first NFL bet? Try betting on something simple, like a player to score a touchdown. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your bet today. You can also bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl right now. DraftKings has the Kansas City Chiefs as the favorite at plus 500, followed by the San Francisco 49ers at plus 600. Ready to do a touchdown dance of your own? New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $250 in bonus bets instantly and get one month of NFL Plus Premium. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. That's code HOOPS for new customers to get $250 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks and get one month of NFL Plus Premium. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. You know, whatever your vibe, it's a Camry vibe. That's the reason the Toyota Camry has been America's best-selling sedan for the past 22 years. 
And the all-new Camry takes it to a new level. With a four-mode drive switch, you're in total control of your ride. I mean, there are Hall of Fame point guards who don't have this level of control. And the Camry's got flash to match. We're talking available 19-inch multi-spoke alloy wheels and chrome dual-tipped exhaust. I mean, this is a seriously good-looking car. And the all-new Camry's got the comfort to go with the looks. Standard dual-tone automatic climate control will have you and your passengers right in their comfort zone. This is the complete package. There are no weaknesses in the Camry's game. You don't see that often on the court or on the road. And because every all-new Camry is a hybrid, it has difference-making fuel efficiency with an up to an EPA-estimated 51 miles per gallon combined. Whatever your vibe, it's a Camry vibe. Learn more at toyota.com slash Camry. All right, on that note, let's get to our mailbag. So our first question from my guy, NMZ Hoops, does really great work uh, covering the league on Twitter. If you guys haven't followed him, I recommend you do. With two-thirds of the league qualifying for some form of postseason play, is it also time to abolish conferences for seeding? Some playoff series will be tougher logistically, but one could argue that 13 of the best 20 teams are out west, and as fans, we want to see more of the best teams complete, uh, compete. Yeah, I was looking at the, uh, um, the standings earlier today, and uh, um, as I was looking at it, it's crazy because there's legitimately 13 teams that are going to be trying to make the playoffs out west. And the one team that's kind of weird in there is, is San Antonio. But like, I, and do I think San Antonio is going to be like a top four seed or anything? No, absolutely not. But like, I think they are going to be kind of in the mix and the play in just simply because Victor Wembanyama is one of the most profoundly impactful young basketball players that we have in the league. And you finally gave him a really high level ball handler in a role that's primarily going to serve to set Victor up. And when you combine that with probably an increase in his minutes and just the sheer frequency that he plays. And I, I shared a stat with you guys when we were talking about player rankings, and I, I don't have it off the top of my head, so I don't want to butcher it, but over the final portion of the season, I can't remember exactly the number of games, but like it was crazy. They were getting their butts kicked with Wemby off the floor, and they were positive with Wemby on the floor over a pretty substantial sample size towards the tail end of the season, which just goes to show you what he's capable of overcoming. And he's going to be surrounded by even more talent in this particular season. Don't forget Harrison Barnes is just a really good veteran player that they've added to the mix. That's going to be a really, really interesting team. And so honestly, like if you think about it, that's 13 teams and three of them are just going to miss the playoffs entirely. Five of them are going to miss the eight team field. And that kind of sucks when we go over to the Eastern Conference and in all likelihood, we're going to have multiple play-in teams that are just bad and very likely a bad team that gets into the final eight. And so I absolutely do think that it would be better for the league in the long run if they just got rid of the conferences and found some way to do You could figure out a way with the schedule. You could read configured divisions and have it so that you play, you know, four times each against these divisions, but then three times uh, in your division, but then three times against everyone else or whatever the specific workings of it would be. But if you did something like that, I'm not concerned about the travel, the increase in the quality of care that these players get in terms of private jets and the, the type of physical training that they get. I, I don't think the flights would be an issue. I think it'd be really fun to see more cross-conference matchups. Like, I think it'd be great to have three or four Celtics Lakers games a year instead of just two, right? You know, like that sort of thing. Like, I think that there's a lot of, uh, of really good basketball that can be uh, brought out of that. And then I think it'd just be better for seeding. Like it really sucked last year that we, when we went into the playoffs, it was like four bloodbath series in the Western conference. And then like, like a bunch of dog shit in the first round in the Eastern conference as every team was, you know, with the exception of that Cavs Magic series, it just was a lot of like, uh, like kind of funky matchups. So, like, even the Indiana Milwaukee series, which would have been entertaining, was bad because of Giannis being out. But, like, in that case, you have multiple, you had two really bad first round series out in the Eastern Conference. And that just, that's just, that's not, that's not a good television product, right? And so, I think it'd be better and, and there'd be more parity if you had it set up with more of a, uh, more of a balanced approach to the bracketing in the postseason. That said, I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think the league is going to make that change. I think it's logistically pretty tough beyond even the travel. It's just a reorganization of the league that can be extremely complicated. And there's, I would imagine people in the league office just think that over time with the talent influx that the Eastern Conference will balance out, the Western Conference will balance out. I would disagree with that just simply because 
I mean, I saw this chart the other day on Instagram. It was kind of crazy. It was like showing all like the total number of like good weather days around the United States. I, some of you guys might've seen this on Instagram, but like, it was like, uh, they were like kind of a darker blue purple when they had like lesser days that were good weather. And then it was like the orange and red color when it was like more days with good weather. And it was like between 60 degrees and 85 degrees with like a, within a certain range of, of humidity. And like, uh, by the way, Tucson was one of the, 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 uh, where I live here in Tucson was one of the a few places outside of California that had 200 plus days of good weather. I've always been a big Tucson fan. I thought that was a cool moment, but California is where all the good weather is. It was crazy to see the map. It literally looked like a bunch of red and orange along the California coast. And then just a bunch of purple and blue everywhere else. Cause it's either hot as shit here or cold as shit there. It rains all the time here, or, you know, humid as hell there. Like it's like, all these people that play in the NBA, they, they start making money. I don't blame them for wanting to move to California. I don't blame them for wanting to get out to the West Coast where the weather is just better and a little bit more consistently good. And so I don't see a universe where like the Eastern Conference balances with the West. My entire lifetime, it's been like this. The entire time I've been following the NBA, it's been like this. The, the East will have phases where the top of the East is good, but it's never been able to balance out in terms of depth with, with the Western Conference. I don't think it's like necessarily a franchise competence thing. I think, it, I think the talent just kind of naturally funnels its way to the better weather on the West Coast. So I don't think it'll ever actually happen, but I think it should, and I think it would be good for the league. How do you feel overall about Joe Missoula? I know you disliked him since you didn't think he valued the possession, but I'm curious if that changed after the title. He was in some ways the most important part of the run and him being the first coach in a while to go for back-to-back. So uh, learning about coaches takes time. It's been one of the more interesting things that I've uh, come across as I've as I've worked in this industry, simply because like th- what it takes to really learn about a coach, there's a beat writing element to it. Like these guys that are in the locker rooms that are asking questions to the coach that are going to shoot around that are going to practice that are deeply involved with the process. It's easier to pick up on that stuff. But like here in Tucson, as I'm just watching a lot of film, like, uh, and like, yeah, like there are times when I try to watch post game pressers, but like in terms of like the amount of film that I need to watch, a lot of times I just prioritize the games. And so I try to pick up what the coaches are doing from the way their teams play. Right. And what got frustrating for me with Joe Missoula is I just hated the way the Celtics were playing for large portions of the last couple of years and uh, just the sheer number of bad possessions that they were uh, putting together on offense. And it was during this postseason run in particular, not just this postseason, really in the springtime, I started to kind of like get more aware of it in like that March, February, late February, March timeframe. But as I started to listen to Joe talk more, And uh, I tried to find more people that cover the Celtics on a really intimate level so that I can learn more from them because they are the guys that are paying attention to every single little thing that, uh, that that their program does over the course of the year. It became clear to me that those were possessions that Joe Missoula didn't approve of. Joe Missoula does believe in the high volume of three point shooting, but he believes in the deliberate process of offense. Uh, they're learning more about the way that they prioritize spacing and like little things. Like for instance, like if you have a, a guard in the corner and a big on the wing, then when I beat my man off the dribble from the opposite wing, I'm more likely to run into a guard in help rather than a big in help. Whereas if the big is in the corner and the guard is on the wing, I'm more likely to run into a big in help rather than the guard. And so even though I'm looking for drive and kick opportunities, if I'm a freaky athlete, if I'm Jalen Brown or, or Jason Tatum and I can get downhill and I've got a 6'3 guard that's stepping over and help on the weak side, I might not even have to kick out for three. I might be able to go all the way to the rim and finish. That's a little basic spacing detail. Like take the time in your possessions to get guys in the right spots, to make it so that when you're running action, you're running it in a way that flows into your player's strengths versus your player's weaknesses. This guy's great from the corner, but weak above the break. Okay, well, let's make sure that he's consistently in the corner as opposed to above the break. Like this guy's really good on the short roll. This guy's not. Okay, then we want to make sure we're running screening actions with this guy in particular who's good at short rolling, catching the ball. These are like little deliberate things that Joe Mazzulla was preaching behind the scenes, and it just took a little while for the Celtics to like, really figure it out. Right. And, um, honestly, like I I think that there is something to be said about the large sample in the sense that like 
the way that you have to play basketball in a meticulous sense in the small sample is different than the large sample. But we just didn't have to run into that with Boston because they kicked the shit out of everybody. They it didn't really end up being an issue where they were uh, having to out execute teams in in the small sample. And so uh, for for Joe and like part of that too is not even Joe's fault. Part of that's like Jason Tatum. Um, has never been particularly great at like the really slow, methodical half court shot creation in crunch time situations, right? So, like at the end of the day, that uh, the, some of the struggles that Boston has had in those areas aren't necessarily Joe Missoula's fault. And they've been so good defensively in the clutch, and they're so damn hard to guard with their five out guys that their clutch numbers have been really damn good. And so, like honestly, like whatever you want to criticize, a lot of people have, uh, like are putting Joe Missoula more in like that Budenholzer category, more of like a system type of coach, but like. Uh, I think over time he'll get even better at the at, at all of the little details, all the little things that um, that he hasn't really had to show with the Celtics. And I think that it's a case of uh, of his philosophy working because I told you guys like the Celtics were a team I used to hate watching, and I actually genuinely enjoyed watching them play in this postseason because they did play with a lot of deliberate offensive process, and they were particular about getting their spacing right. And they got a lot of really good shots, and it made them really, really difficult to beat. Did they play any of the super, super good teams in the league that I wanted to see them play? No, but like we'll get to see that this year, and it'll be just another challenge for these guys. And I'm, I'm curious to see how they react. Uh, uh, but I, I Joe Missoula was a play, uh, was a coach that I became more fond of over the course of this season, and in general, the Celtics and the way they play is something that I've become more fond of over the course of this season. What are the three most important things the Chicago Bulls can slash should do in order to pull themselves out of the hole they created? Love the show. Been a fan for years. Keep killing it, bro. Thanks for the support. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm a big believer in the process of rebuilding, cent centering around finding the uh, the top tier talent, right? Like step one is like, who's going to be your guy? Like the guy that you build the entire system around, right? Especially on the offensive end of the floor. From there, it's like, well, what's that guy's strengths and weaknesses? Let's find a number two that complements him well. And then from there, we want to find role players that fit within the way that those players like to play. So if it's Luca, I'm looking for play finishers. If it's more of a five out kind of guy, I'm looking for guys that can dribble, shoot and pass in a system, right? So like it all depends on what your, uh, your framework is. Now the Crusoe for Josh Giddy uh, trade, it uh, like there's always going to be part of me that wonders if you could have gotten a little bit more for Crusoe, but at the same time, like it doesn't make sense to hoard a really high level role player when you don't have the actual top end talent to make it work. And so that's actually an example of a deal. And what they're giving what they're giving themselves an opportunity to see is like, okay, let's let's cash in this asset in Alex Caruso that doesn't really help us in the short term because he's a ceiling raiser among supreme talent, right? Like we know what he can do alongside the best players in the world. Cause we saw it with LeBron and AD in the, with the Lakers where he can like almost reach you to another height because of all of those little things that he does. Right. But th that benefit just doesn't matter to the bulls cause they suck. Right. And this was a, a, an extended period with the DeRozan, um, with that core with DeRozan and Vucevic and Zach Levine where they just weren't able to even keep their heads above water, let alone be a, even into a, uh, a, a some sort of deep playoff run where you could see what those guys are like in that setting. And so as you pivot, it's like, okay, well, let's see what Josh Giddy can do. And then from there, you start to give more high volume ball handling responsibilities to guys like Kobe White, to guys like Josh Giddy, and you find out what they're capable of with the ball in their hands. Let's say you find out that Josh Giddy is actually like a legitimate offensive engine to start around. Well, it's like, okay, well, now we we feel like Josh Giddy might actually be good enough, but we're going to give ourselves a number two that's more of like a role man because we know we need Josh Giddy on the ball. So like maybe it's more of like a, a player that's in like the Shangun kind of archetype, the Anthony Davis type of archetype, like a a, a power forward center that is a guy that can complement Josh Giddy with these supreme gifts on both ends of the floor, but doesn't necessarily need to dominate the basketball where Giddy's standing in the corner where teams are going to put their center on him and not have to worry about guarding him, right? And so this is essentially a waiver. You're, you're trying Giddy, trying Giddy to just see how it looks. Giving Kobe White more ball handling responsibility. Let's just see how it looks. And then from there, it's it's either going to make some sense or it might be one of those things where you end up flipping Giddy. You could revitalize Giddy's value. Uh, that like That's where this Caruso trade could end up working out in a big way. What if Giddy goes for you know, 19, 10, and 9 over the first half of the season and a team out there that like desperately needs ball handling 
ends up making some kind of move for him and then you get draft compensation back, right? That is what could potentially open the door for you to potentially find that top end piece. But you're basically starting from scratch. There's no use in finding useful role players at this point because it doesn't fit your timeline. It's more important for you to cash in those guys for draft assets if you have them. Uh, like what you did with Caruso. From there, you're giving reps to guys that uh, that haven't had high volume ball handling reps, and you're just continuing to look for uh, for talent in the draft. It's like step one is admitting that you know that you have an issue, and it took a little too long. Um, but for them to finally admit that the Vucevic, Levine, and DeRozan core wasn't enough was a good step in the right direction. Um, I don't know if they'll be able to find a Levine trade partner, but eventually he'll be an expiring contract, and at that point he will be someone who carries some value, and so you can cash him in at that point. Uh, again, it's far away, but at this point it's like making uh, making sure that you're taking in assets as much as possible by getting rid of anything that has any sort of value around the league, trusting in your scouting department to find talent, and you're seeking those foundational pieces, the guys that you can build the rest of the roster around. I've been meaning to ask you about your experience of the Golden State Cavs days, given that LeBron and Steph are your one and two favorite players, but you recently said that you hated Steph back then. Which moment slash event made you fall in love or out of hate with Steph and earlier with LeBron? So uh, I've told everybody the story about LeBron. It just was, that's how I fell in love with the game of basketball. I was raised in a household that was very much baseball and football focused. Uh, my little brother played football at West Point. My older brother uh, played junior college football and was a very good high school player. Um, uh, they were big baseball guys too. That was just what they did, right? And that's what my family did. And I just randomly got tall. Um, nobody in my family is over 6'1", and I'm 6'6". So, like, it just was kind of one of those things where I, I kind of was just naturally inclined to the game. But I randomly, in 2006, and it was Game 7, too. It was Game 7 of the 2006 second-round series between the Cavs and the Pistons. When the Pistons uh, – it was Game 7. And uh, Pistons beat the shit out of them. Like, it wasn't even close. Uh, but that was actually my first, like, real time sitting down and watching NBA basketball and kind of falling in love with it. And so then I just started like following LeBron's career. And obviously you guys all remember what happened in 2007 when he took him all the way to the finals. And so just immediately fell in love with the game. And LeBron just became like my sentimental attachment to the game because he was the player that got me to fall in love with it. And so as you can imagine, a kid that never did anything with basketball as a kid to like picking it up as a teenager and then getting my school paid for for it, and now it's what I do for a living. Like, the game of basketball is so important to me, and so, like, LeBron is, like, always going to be, like, my emotional weak spot in terms of analysis in the sense that, like, I love other NBA players, but not the same way, just because LeBron will always have an attachment to, like, my childhood love for the game, right, if that makes sense. Now, as far as the hate thing with Steph, hate's the wrong word. Um, obviously I, I hated having to compete against him, not individually, but as a fan, having to watch my favorite team compete against him. And I just was, he's so damn good. And as a roster, they were so damn good, especially when they added Kevin Durant, like it just was annoying. Right. But it's, you know how it is. Like it, it like, uh, uh, it, as time passes, you start to grow up and you start to like 2016, 2015, that would have been. I graduated high school in 09, so I would have been like, what, 24, something like that. I was still kind of a kid, right? Like, I was still handling it the way a 24-year-old would as a fan, you know? And so, like, as I got older and as I dove deeper into the game and as I started to coach and as I started to cover the league, it's like you grow to appreciate these guys in a different way, right? Especially now that I'm more, we are not rooting for them to compete against each other as much anymore. And so, at that point, like... uh there were several key things that really drove me to like Steph. One, his competitiveness. I like. Uh, I, I am. I've always been just like super annoyed with people that don't show the requisite amount of fight uh, in sporting events. And what I've always loved about Steph is like I never felt for a second like he wasn't giving everything he had in a big moment, just simply because the dude hated losing more than anything else. Um, I had a conversation with Ethan Strauss on his podcast a few months ago, and we were talking about Steph and he was pointing out like that Steph's favorite sport might be golf and how like a lot of the all time greats are guys that like are more competitive than they are lovers of the game, right? Like Michael Jordan's another example of that. LeBron famously loves football. Like it, it's, I've found that to be very fascinating, <clears throat> but it was like, it was the, uh, first the overall just sheer competitiveness 
to the 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 making the most out of his specific set of gifts. Like I was always super impressed by like the weight training regimen from Steph Curry. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but that was the main driver of his success. Famously, after 2015, he went to 2016 and he raised his scoring average by like six points a game. When he and he had already won MVP and then got six points a game better, and he attributed most of it to lower body weightlifting. And the fact that it just made it so that he could get lift and separation better. And like, obviously we've seen what he's done with his upper body. We've seen what he's done to become a useful defender over the course of his prime. And that's just a lot of, uh, a lot of work. And it's a testament because there's a lot of guys that have similar physical gifts that just didn't do that and didn't reach their potential. And Steph's going to go down as one of the 10 best players of all time, in my opinion, uh, as the only guy in that list that's below six, five, and certainly the only guy that doesn't have supreme athletic gifts. And so it just, that was what drew, drew me to Steph. And there's a lot of skill stuff too. Like I've always been uh, really impressed by Steph's ability to quickly reset his base off the dribble. There are some footwork things that I've stolen from him specifically like outside foot when you're moving laterally. Steph will like hit a dribble combination into a step back and cover a shit ton of ground, but then like go straight up and down at the end. But if you watch, like if he's going to the left, like he'll stick his left foot way out and he'll catch his body and reset his base to go straight up and down, which is a footwork element, but also a strength element. But there are elements of that that I've I've tried to steal with the the way that I play the game. And at, over time, I just found out pretty quickly that as I looked around at the other players around the league, like there wasn't anybody that was doing the kind of stuff that Steph was doing. And, and all of a sudden, he became one of my favorite players. And I really, really, really enjoyed rooting for him over the tail end of his career. It's been a much better experience than uh, rooting against him the way I did. Uh, with LeBron when he was, or with uh, Steph when he was younger. What are the best ways for offensively limited rosters to squeeze the most juice out of their personnel? Teams like the Heat or the Wolves are clearly great defensively, but lack some offensive firepower to push them over the edge. So, you know, it's interesting because there's a, uh, there's the half court element and then there's the total game element, right? So like, any team that has offensively limited personnel but has defensively minded personnel, there are ways to uh, to elevate your offensive performance on the margins. So, for instance, uh, getting out in transition as much as possible. Okay, so you're freaky athletic and good at defense. Well, don't play in the half court if you don't have to, right? Like That was a big thing with the 2020 Lakers. They were a little bit limited in the half court because they had a bunch of big, strong dudes and some of them couldn't shoot very well. But like they were just so damn good defensively and they were so damn good in transition that it just didn't matter. And then in the half court, LeBron and AD were able to make enough shots, right? Like with teams like Minnesota, Minnesota is a great example of this. Like they need to get stops and get out in transition. Like it was so funny to watch that Denver series. Like whenever they were getting stops and forcing turnovers and getting out in transition, they were killing Denver. But then every time the game slowed down into the half court, Denver was killing them. It was like a super interesting dynamic. So first is like, exploit the margins as much as possible. That's not just transition. That's also uh, like attacking the offensive glass. If you're bigger and more athletic, you can do damage on the offensive glass, right? There are different ways to squeeze those things out in the margins. In the half court, it's schematics. It's ball and uh, player movement. If you have a player that's limited as a shooter, don't let him stand at the three-point line. Let him function more as a cutter and as a screener, right? If you have two non-shooters on the floor, you can actually run five out. This is one of the most common things that I see people get wrong in the YouTube comments. I see people be like, they do run five out. They have this guy that can shoot at center. And it's like running five out has nothing to do with how many players can shoot five out is entirely about where players are while the action is being run. The simplest way to put it is like in five out, you never have a player just chilling in the dunker spot or, uh, or like a big man. That's just, uh, just like permanently perched around the basket in five out. Your big guys are up around the elbows and they're working as dribble handoff fulcrums guys still go to the basket. They cut to the basket. They screen and roll to the basket They drive to the basket, but they're not permanently uh, occupying that space. There are lots of different ways. Like five-out offense manifests in a bunch of different ways, right? Like we see Golden State. It's like two non-shooters, a lot of guys coming off of screens looking to shoot, right? Boston, it's more individual two-man game to try to get a defense in rotation. You'll see guys end up in the dunker spot. Uh, You'll see guards end up in the dunker spot just because as they're kind of going through the action, they'll briefly make themselves available. If it's there, they'll catch and finish. If not, they'll quickly get the fuck out of there, right? Like it's, it's guys aren't just like perched around the basket. That's all five out is five out is ball and player movement with your non shooters functioning as fulcrums away from the baskets, cutting and rolling into the paint rather than standing in the paint. That's the, the main difference, right? Um, but like within that, you can craft roles that make sense. It's just different from team to team, right? So like 
Golden State with their non-shooters and guys uh, uh, setting screens and guys flying off of screens shooting. They can't play the way Boston does because they can't get the dribble penetration, but Boston can't play the way Golden State does because they don't have guys like Steph and Clay or used to be Clay, that could fly off of a screen and rise up and shoot a jump shot, right? Like, they're, Boston is a bunch of good catch-and-shoot guys, not a bunch of great movement shooters, right? So it's two different forms of five-out offense that that uh, um, uh, that essentially center around the same concept of the paint being something that you temporarily occupy, you don't permanently occupy, right? But, like, with your team, so, like, with uh with the Minnesota, for instance, right? Like they do their best to try to have Rudy Gobert screen and roll into space, and they try their best to have Jaden McDaniels occasionally come off of a dribble handoff, but there are just certain limitations in terms of ball handling and shooting from the non Anthony Edwards, non Mike Conley, non Cat uh Carl Anthony Towns players that they just have a certain ceiling in the half court. That's where you try to maximize it as much on the margins by getting out in transition by attacking the offensive glass. But in the half court it's just like don't like it's like Jared Vanderbilt with the Lakers. You don't have him staying in the corner. That's a waste of what Jared Vanderbilt is uh, is good and bad at. Like you're better off having him screen and roll into space. Jared Vanderbilt was a bad offensive player with the Lakers two years ago. He actually was pretty solid before he got hurt in January because he was functioning more as a screener and as a cutter. What is a successful season for San Antonio? Play in and smash by Oklahoma City Denver. Wemby establishing himself in the top ten. Um, I, I'd say the big thing is getting big game experience. Like you, it's hard to learn about what a player is good and bad at until there's real, real high leverage situations. Physicality ramps up, scouting ramps up. It's easier for you to identify weaknesses. If you get, let's say, you get a play in matchup and you squeak into the play and you play a first round series, but you get your butt kicked, you're going to learn a lot more about Devin Vassell and Victor Wembanyama and what their strengths and weaknesses are. From there, you can learn more about how to accentuate their strengths and how to fight against and limit their flaws. But you got to have high leverage moments for you to see that. I'm a big believer in like, like San Antonio is at the point where <clears throat> like uh, you need to find out whether or not Devin Vassell can be the go-to perimeter guy next to Victor Wembanyama. That's what you got to find out. If he is, then your entire focus shifts to finding high quality two-way role players to fit their offense, right? Um, but if Devin Vassell is not good enough, then your attention has to s- turn more towards we got to find a number two for Victor Wembanyama, right? The only way to find that is to get into high leverage moments and see what these guys look like when the shit hits the fan. With Vando and Christian Wood seeming to both be out of the start of the regular season, even though nothing official has come out yet with Vando, how effect? Excuse me. How effectively do you think the Lakers will stay afloat? They lost key players like Spencer and Torian Prince, and seem to be doomed defensively. Uh, I think they're going to be fine in the regular season. I don't think they're going to be a top four seed or anything like that, but I think they'll be in that five to eight range most of the year. Again, they were they won 30 of their last 45 games. They were the fourth best record in the league after January 7th with this group of guys. That was with Vanderbilt hurt. That was with Christian Wood hurt. That was with Gabe Vincent barely playing until the very end of the year. Gabe Vincent being back and healthy will go a long way because that gives them a guard that can guard at the point of attack and kind of like level some things out in terms of distribution of resources. Like it'd be great if Austin Reeves didn't have to guard the other team's best guard every single night, right? Um, that said, like even with all the flaws that we've talked about, LeBron and AD are still two of the top 10 players in the league playing damn near at the top of their games at this point in time. Austin Reeves is still a, still a baller. D'Angelo Russell, say what you want about him. He's a good regular season player. Rui Hachimura, Still don't know really what he is because he had an awesome playoff run two years ago and then an awful playoff run last year. Uh, but they're good enough to be a good regular season team. I think a lot of people are off the Lakers scent as a standings kind of team because they went 3-10 and 10 in December and it nuked their situation. But they were really good most of the year last year. And so as long as they continue to play like that, I expect them to be really good most of the year this year. Uh, now, whether or not they can enter into that top tier of championship contenders, that is all going to come down to whatever big trade they end up making at some point this season. Do you think the Lakers would be better off if LeBron was more off the ball, averaging around 20 instead of his 25, letting D'Lo and Austin create, especially given D'Lo's, uh, that D'Lo grades out well in playmaking talent, but became a top-tier low man in the regular season? Stay blessed. Um, I, I actually am the opposite with LeBron. LeBron, in my opinion, is still a devastating offensive player when he's devoting his resources there and his jump shots going in. Obviously, two years ago, he had that weird bad jump shooting season. But last year he was a great jump shooter and was one of the best half court shot creators in the league. So what I want to do is I want to alleviate LeBron's defensive job. If I can actually go to LeBron and be like, hey dude, like 
you can chill on defense for the most part. I just need you to create shots. That's actually, I think, the best way to use LeBron at this age. You know, you want to use him for his brain at this point. I want the ball in his hands. I want him making decisions. It's specifically when he has to do most of the defensive work while Austin and D'Lo are off doing everything with the ball where I can see some diminishing returns because LeBron still won't try on defense in the regular season. <laughs> so like, that's my main thing is uh, the main thing I think the Lakers need to do is create an easier defensive job for LeBron in the regular season. Maybe that's a too big look. That's Christian Wood is somebody that would, who would help with that. So hopefully he's not out for too long. Uh, getting Jared Vanderbilt back would be a huge boost in that specific regard, but just making LeBron's defensive job easier is is the best thing you can do for the regular season because LeBron still is one of the best offensive players in the league, in my opinion. What's Brandon Ingram's future in the league? What team makes sense to give him the best chance to fulfill his potential? Um, Brandon's, in my opinion, one of the like kind of underrated on-ball forwards in the league. He just kind of has to be on the ball. He's not a player that like really functions well off the ball and like ball and player movement. And so I think about teams that have really good defenses that would benefit from his pull-up jump shooting and some of his more surgical shot creation in the half court, but also kind of need talent. So a team, the team, two teams that I put up here were like teams like Cleveland or Miami. Now with Cleveland, I think that also would come hand in hand with trading one of the guards, probably Darius Garland. Uh, but I think that would give them a little bit more firepower and that would also kind of fit their system in a way that I, I think would struggle elsewhere. And then Miami, it's just you're you're at a point where you're a little bit desperate and you got to make a talent play. And uh, I, I think Brandon Ingram would be an interesting fit there. But I don't know. I don't know where he's going to end up. This is going to be really interesting to see because I think his value is in the gutter right now. But he obviously was playing hurt or coming back from an injury last year, so I don't think that was necessarily the best way to evaluate him. Uh, so I'm I think it'll start with him in New Orleans, hopefully revamping his value a little bit, and then from there I think there will be a team that's a little bit desperate looking for some talent that'll jump on him. Um, let's see here. We've got a healthy Kawhi at his peak versus Curry. Who would you take in a playoff situation and who would be easier to build a contender around Curry? No question. Uh, Kawhi for as good as he is, is not the type of guy that you can count on to consistently generate quality shots over a large sample. He's a better small sample guy because no one can stop him from getting to his spots, and he's one of the best individual shot uh, shot makers that we have in the league when he's healthy. But like, if I get Curry, I know that just off the jump, I'm just going to get a bunch of really good shots all year long. I also know that with Curry, I can get away with playing a lot of defensive-minded personnel, um, as Golden State has done over the years. I don't, I don't think that one's particularly close. I would go with Curry. Who's your dark horse NBA champion contender based on the moves that were made this offseason. So we have a couple new top tier contenders, right? I think the Knicks, after they got Mikhail Bridges, I think that puts them in the top tier. You just Brunson, Bridges, OG, Randall, Robinson. That's just a really damn good top five with a lot of size and athleticism and strength and shot making. And that's just a really good team. Uh, and then Oklahoma City getting Hartenstein. I think that puts them in their group. But there's a bunch of different teams that are uh, that are in the mix there. Uh, obviously, the obvious ones like Dallas and Minnesota are two teams that I think could be right back in the mix this year. Milwaukee, if uh, um, if those two uh, guards that they brought in uh, end up uh, working out for them on the defensive end of the floor to kind of make things easier, and if Giannis and Dame have a better season, uh, obviously the Philly. I don't think you can write out because of the Embiid factor. What if Embiid just has healthy? knees all year and then he what if he just kicks everyone's ass in the postseason and they also have Paul George and Tyrese Maxey right so that's one and then the Lakers if they landed a big trade because uh, LeBron and AD are still the two of the top 10 players in the league and if you get them good two-way players around them I think that's a devastating combo let's see um what's your favorite shot to make when you play basketball not your most efficient but your most enjoyable shot to put in the basket that's an interesting question I would say the the shot that I feel the best about when I make is probably a left shoulder fade, particularly from the right block when I'm facing over my right shoulder. Uh, the left shoulder fade is one of the toughest shots that I've ever worked on. The right shoulder fade as a right-handed shooter is easier because you don't have to square up in midair. 
Um, but when you're turning over your left shoulder, you actually have to swing your right leg all the way around. And one of the things I learned from Kobe is you deliberately swing that leg around and the momentum of your leg will naturally turn your body for you as you're turning. And it just alleviates some of the workload of actually getting squared up. But like when I, when I pivot over my left shoulder and hit a fadeaway, it's such a great feeling because it's such a tough shot. Uh, it's all about legs too. Like it's interesting. Like when I make it or miss it, it almost always comes down to, did I get enough lift? Like if I spin over that left shoulder and I get really good lift, it, to me, it just feels like a jump shot at the end. But like, that's the fascinating part about that specific shot. It's just all lower body work to get you to where you can knock down a shot. It's definitely a satisfying feeling for me. Um, easily my most efficient go-to move though, is that right shoulder fade. Like if I need a bucket in a pickup game and it's game point, I, I'm calling for the ball on the right block and I'm bumping with my right shoulder and trying to get to my right shoulder fade because that's a shot that I feel like I can make a good half the time um, uh, uh, in a big spot like that. Last question. The Warriors team closely resembles the 22 team. Would you be surprised if they made a run like 22? This is an interesting question because they do resemble the 22 team, specifically just swapping out role players for a couple of guys that are a little bit more of a better fit, right? Like getting a DeAnthony Melton, who I think is like, it's interesting. I've always looked at him as like, KCP is more of a movement shooter. D'Anthony Melton's more of an off the dribble shooter or off the dribble player. But both of them are like two guys that I consider to be rock solid NBA starters. I think KCP at his peak was better, but I think D'Anthony Melton is really, really damn good. I think D'Anthony Melton is the kind of guy that's going to be a two guard, if you can say healthy. He's going to be a two guard on a really damn good team one day. Um, I mean, he's been on some good Philly teams, but. Uh, what I specifically like about that is his ability to put the ball on the floor kind of makes a lot of sense within Golden State's offense coming off of screens. Kyle Anderson, in addition to being one of the most versatile defensive forwards in the league, is a guy that has a bunch of offensive limitations, but if you put him in dribble handoffs with Steph, I think he could actually be a pretty impactful defense, uh, offensive player. And we talked about earlier Golden State's offense and how they can usually work with two non-shooters as dribble handoff fulcrums. They did it with Looney and Draymond, right? They did it with Bogut and Draymond, right? Like we've seen that a bunch of times. They did it with JaVale McGee and Draymond sometimes, right? Like that dual fulcrum kind of concept, I think Kyle Anderson fits that really nicely. So in a lot of ways, it resembles the 22 team because they went from the 2021 team, which was clunky and weird, to a couple of role player tweaks and all of a sudden it comes together. The main difference is that Steph isn't the same player. Steph was, in my opinion the best or second best player in the league in 2021, 2022. And he just isn't at that level right now. So if Steph can get back to that top five player type of form, then I think we could be looking at a Warriors team that's one deal away from real championship contention. It's just a question of whether or not Steph can get it back to that point. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. I will see you guys on YouTube after the final buzzer of Aces Fever. 